following audio is from St. Nick's Durham. As a church, we exist to love God, love people and love Durham. We hope that this sermon will serve you well as a supplement to your regular Bible reading, prayer and participation in your local church. For more information about St. Nick's Durham, directions or resources, please visit stnicks.org.uk. Tonight's reading is, um, sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and the whole verse, which you'll find on page 1154 of the Bibles in front of you. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy, and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor, and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled, Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. I'd like to invite Richard to come up and I'll I'll pray for you. Father, send down your Holy Spirit now upon Richard, that the words he may speak may be what you wish us to hear this evening, and that the meditations of our hearts may too be pleasing in your holy sight, and that we may gain from this sermon what you wish to speak to us. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. One Corinthians chapter 13, love is good, better than the alternatives. I think that just about covers it. Any questions? Well, I have a few. Just thought you were going to get away quickly there, didn't you? What is love? Why is Paul talking about love here in this passage? Did he get interrupted three quarters of the way through his letter and asked if he could include a text for a wedding sermon? And what are we supposed to do about this, about love? These and other questions will keep us occupied for the next few minutes as we attend to the Apostles' great passage on the wonders of love. So I thought I'd take a run-up at love in 1 Corinthians 13 by doing a couple of things. First, I asked around about what love is. What do you think it is? A couple of our young people in church this morning gave me answers. Love is when you like someone. The other one said, love is adoration. Well, that was quite good for 
a random question on a Sunday morning. It's a good start. Any others? It's awesome. Awesome. Love is awesome. Thank you. Love is when you are stunned into silence by being asked a question. What was that? Not self-seeking. I think that's said in 1 Corinthians 13, isn't it? <laughs> he spotted a quick trick to answering the question there. <laughs> Anything else? Safe. Safe. Faith? Safe. Safe. Love is safe. Is that what you said? <laughs> Love is when I turn my hearing aid up. <laughs> Anything else? A doing word. Okay. Love is a doing word. Love is a verb. People start to have cold shakes when they think, I never understood what verbs were when I was at school, but thank you for telling me. Love is a doing word. Love is an action. Love involves doing things. Yes. Anything else? Love is sacrifice. Yep. Excellent. One of the things that this is showing us is that we need a range of words to get at what love is. Tom Wright, in his book on 1 Corinthians for Everyone, adds in other words like affection and compassion. I can't resist quoting Tom Wright here, actually, because what he says is, Paul is not talking about the same thing as we mean when we say, I love tennis, or I love the color orange. I nearly wore my orange hoodie, my orange St. Nick's hoodie, to read that line out to you. He says, however, if we, take, uh, if we love a colour as much as that, we will do the things which enable us to paint or observe our favourite colour. Brothers and sisters, you heard it from Tom Wright here first. We need the church to be painted orange. <laughs> because that's what love is. I, I may not have fully understood everything he's saying in that discussion, but I do recommend the book very highly in the light of that comment. A second thing I thought it would be interesting to do is to cast our minds back to the beginning of the Bible to set the scene and see how love enters into the story. Are you ready? The first thing the Bible says I'm going to go right back uh, and simplify and paraphrase here, although this must be a very long sermon indeed. First thing the Bible says is that in the beginning, everything was good. God got everything working, and it was all good. The second thing the Bible says, again, I'm speaking in broad brushstrokes here, is that this good world is broken by our sin, our selfishness, our failure to put God and other people first by looking out for ourselves. This is the double opening claim of Scripture. The world is good and the world is broken. Lose either one of these and you're going to end up with a distorted picture, either naively thinking everything's okay uh, when clearly it's not, uh, or worriedly obsessing about how awful everything is when in fact God's goodness is still part of our lives. Now, Genesis 1 doesn't say God loved the world. The Bible will say that eventually, but it doesn't start there. And Genesis 2 and 3 do not say Adam and Eve's failure was about failing to love, though in a way I think you could make both those claims. It actually takes quite a while for the Bible to get round to talking about love. I will be very impressed if anyone here knows the first mention of love in the Bible, it will indicate either an enviable knowledge of Scripture or rapid access to a search function on the Bible app on your phone. And if you don't know what that is, ask a teenager. It does depend on what translation you're using, but the best candidates for the first mention of love in the Bible are either Abraham talking about Sarah's love for him in Genesis chapter 20, or God talking about Abraham's love for his son Isaac 
in Genesis 22. And there's a pattern here. The next mentions of love are Isaac loves Rebecca, Isaac loved Esau, Rebecca loved Jacob, lots of mentions of Jacob loving Rachel. What are we noticing? That love is between people. It takes a while for the Bible to get round to talking about the fact that God loves Israel. We get there in the Ten Commandments, talking about his steadfast love to thousands, and eventually it does become clear that the Bible wants to say God loves Israel or God loves us or to find ways of celebrating God's love. But the way the story begins, love is what nourishes and strengthens the relationships between family members. The way the story begins, love is about strengthening the relationships between family members. I've often wondered if it's significant that the book of Genesis gives us a book-long introduction to uh, the importance of extended family relationships before we get on in Exodus and everything else to the laws of Israel and the life of the people of God as a whole. So, to Paul in 1 Corinthians 13. Paul, who has been arguing with the church in Corinth for several long chapters now, and the Paul for whom family is in the process of being redefined as God's church. This is not about individual churches being like families, though we might experience them like that. For Paul, it is the worldwide church of God that is our first family. And so when I or any preacher or leader says from the front, brothers and sisters, it's not just a piece of religious language, it's a reminder that we are part of God's one holy church and therefore bound together in relationships that extend across this particular church, but also across Durham, across England and around the world. Paul certainly does think that God loves us, that Jesus Christ loves us, that God loves us in Christ. But as a matter of observation, he does not mention that here in 1 Corinthians 13, which is all about what I want to call family relationships, i.e. in God's church. And in this, I think Paul is going back to the way that love enters in into the world in Genesis, in the ways that people love one another across the extended family networks of the Bible's first family, the family of Father Abraham, who, in case you have forgotten the song, had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham, and I am one of them, and so are you. So let's all praise the Lord, right arm, left leg. Although, in case you're wondering, that bit doesn't actually come from the Bible. <laughs> what Paul does in this chapter we're looking at is to take many of the things he's been criticizing the Corinthians for in the first 12 chapters and contrast them with the way of love. Here's a few examples. They are very excited about speaking in tongues. But without love, it is nothing, says Paul. They are very excited about who has the most impressive prophecies. And to be fair, Paul himself is excited about prophecy too. But it is nothing without love. They are rather preoccupied with boasting, always about impressive spiritual stuff, of course. But love, says Paul, does not boast. They are falling out and arguing, but love keeps no record of wrongs. They like to sing a popular Corinthian song about saviour, he can move the mountains. But I don't care how many mountains you can move, says Paul, if you can't love one another. And we could go on. So I hope we can see that this is far from a random wedding sermon dropped in by Paul because he was wondering how to finish off a long letter. But it is, in fact, a slightly pointed response to some of their failings that he has been engaging with 
in the previous chapters. To draw one lesson from this, love is not something we are invited to think about in the abstract, removed from the ups and downs of our daily lives. But love is Paul's pointed proposal for what will make the difference in the midst of our daily lives. Ups and downs and all, in our own extended networks of relationships, including, though not perhaps limited to, in the church. I do think Paul is talking first about the church. But by implication, he is painting a portrait of the kind of people we could and should be always and everywhere. And so it's not just about being in church. And in this sense, although there is a long and honorable tradition of using 1 Corinthians 13 as a text from the Bible to read at a wedding, there's a risk here that we fall for the old Hollywood trap where love in many films is presented as the goal and the end of the story. Romantic love as an escape or release from the complications and complexities of life. As the happy couple finally fall into each other's arms, the credits roll, an uplifting song plays, and they drive off into the sunset. Entertaining as that may be in a film, it does not match up to the realities of our day-to-day -day living. For all of us, in whatever network of relationships we live in, where love is not about getting away from our troubles, but love is about being transformed into loving people in the midst of our troubles. Love is not about getting away from our troubles, it is about being transformed into loving people in the midst of our troubles. Hence Paul saying to Corinth, love is a better way, the most excellent way. And hence Paul saying to us as we listen in that love is a better way, the most excellent way. And Paul imagining us all as people marked out by faith and by hope and by love of which love is the greatest because we are in for the long haul and we need to let love transform us from the inside out. And now I am going to finish by saying something that Paul does not say. I always think it's helpful when preachers clarify that they're doing that. I'm gonna finish by saying something that Paul does not say in 1 Corinthians 13 at least, but I do think it's true, and it relates to what we are supposed to do with this passage that is all about love. Because I'm keen to avoid preaching a sermon that leaves us all feeling crushed about how poor our record is at loving people. If you have a perfect record of loving people, you can leave now, you're done. Uh, but I'm keen to avoid us feeling crushed by how poor our record can be about loving people. Let's take an example. Love is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Verse five. Am I easily angered? Sometimes. Do I keep records of wrongs? Well, <laughs> you don't have to spend long in any church from Corinth right through to County Durham to know that churches can be full of people with quite an impressive list of all the times that they have been wronged. So does the preacher at this point say, listen up everyone, you need to do better. You need to be more loving. I have heard sermons like that. I've probably even preached them, to be fair. But overall, I don't think it's very helpful. And I don't think it's what Paul is doing here. Paul is not writing a series of commands about being loving, but a series of descriptions, of pen portraits, if you like, 
He's not telling us to love, but he's telling us what love looks like. Of course, he would like nothing more than for all of us to be really good at putting this into practice, but he doesn't deal with that by saying, put it into practice. Instead, he depicts love as a many splendid thing throughout this chapter. And then he moves on and talks about more ways that love can make a practical difference. Clearly, he wants us to be more loving. And he thinks that the kinds of issues that cause trouble in churches, that are causing trouble in Corinth, for example, can only be dealt with ultimately by learning love. But why then does he not simply say, love one another, command? Or even, this is how you should love one another, directive. So this is the thing that Paul doesn't say in 1 Corinthians 13, but which I think he is assuming and which has informed the whole letter of 1 Corinthians uh, throughout and in due course will inform all his other letters too. It's this. If you want to become a more loving person, you don't achieve it by aiming at love, but you achieve it by aiming at God, by focusing on God's love, by seeking to love God, by receiving from God the love and the forgiveness and the acceptance that makes our own love possible. When Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, it was the common practice for a secretary to write the actual physical copy of the letter, and then Paul, or whoever the author was, would add a final greeting in his own writing, which partly proved that it was genuinely from him, after all. If you look at the end of 1 Corinthians, which is the end of chapter 16, page 1158, if you want to see it in the Church Bible, you'll find him saying, it's about four lines from the end of the letter, I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. And what does he say in this very brief, final, handwritten add-on at the end of it all? He says, if anyone does not love the Lord, let that person be cursed, which is strong language. I think it means they are excluded from God's blessing. But do you see what the core point is? At the end of it all, at the end of 1 Corinthians, the core issue is that we love the Lord. And for myself, I share this in case you find it helpful, the list of characteristics of love in 1 Corinthians 13 functions a bit like a checklist a reminder of some of the reasons why I know I am not yet fully transformed into Christ-like living. So it's a kind of a negative description. And I try to pay attention to times when I am not kind, or when I boast, or when I keep a mental record of people sinning against me, as a reminder that I am still always in need of God. So to summarize what I've been saying, I want to be a loving person. I will not achieve this by trying harder to be a loving person. But I have hope if instead I focus on loving, knowing, and following God. All Paul is asking for, it turns out, is complete transformation from the inside out of heart and soul and mind and body. And the only way to be transformed from the inside out is to hand everything over to God and let God do it. We think we know best. The Corinthians thought they knew best, but we do not. 
Will it work? Will we become loving people if we do this? I note that Paul remains hopeful right to the end of the passage, and he writes, love never fails, which I think we could expand to, love never fails because God never fails. So yes, we have hope. In the midst of our difficulties, our burdens, our daily trials, comes this word from 2,000 years ago, ever new, the word of God living and active among us. Faith, hope, and love remain, and the greatest of these is love. Thank you for listening to the St. Nick's Durham podcast. If you'd like to hear more sermons and teaching like this, then subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. For more information about St. Nick's, visit our website at stnicks.org.uk.